Hi everybody. So today's video is going to introduce and talk about the Euclidean algorithm. It's one of the um, earliest things that we know of to be an algorithm and it vastly predates computers and it still turns out to be really useful today and important for um, modern encryption among other things. So here I'll get my um, face out of the way. Uh, here's the definition of GCD. You should know this already from discrete math class. Um, but it's, it's the largest thing that divides any two given numbers. And I really want to highlight this really comes from like something like 300 BC when uh, Euclid wrote this down. And who knows how long it was known before then, um, if it was just recorded at that time. But the idea is um, we can write it recursively like this. There's different ways of formulating this algorithm, but um, we like recursive algorithms in this class, and they're a little bit nicer for analysis. So that's what we're going to look at. Um, so you start with two numbers, A and B. Usually you want A to be greater than B. Um, and then if the second number is zero, then the GTD is the first one. Um, so that's that's a little bit counterintuitive, but that's saying like kind of technically anything is a divisor of zero. So then the largest divisor of something in zero is always the first number. And the real magic is this one. So to compute the GCD, we repeatedly take the second number and move it up to the first position and take the first number, mod the second one. Um, and so this is the recursive call that's really gonna do the work of the GCD. So for example, um, if we wanted the GCD of 100 and 247. Well, actually I should write that as the, the other way around because uh, usually we want the larger number first here, although it would work either way. So I'll say the GCD of 247 and 100. Um, the way that you might have learned this before to do this GCD is by factoring both numbers. So you would say like 100 is um, 2 times 2 times 5 times 5 and 247. Oh, you guys can factor 247 in your head, right? Well, no, it's kind of hard. But if you did it, you would see that 247 is 3 times 19. And in fact, this is the reason why we don't want to use this method. So th this method would tell us, yes, that these don't have any common factors, so the GCD equals 1. But the problem is that this, as we saw before, computing the factorization is very slow for large numbers. Um, you know, I could figure it out for 247, but if we added a few more digits to that number, it would be really difficult. And if we added a few, few more digits, it would be impossible for any computer in a reasonable amount of time. So the point of this algorithm is to actually have an algorithm that doesn't depend on factorization. So let's see how it works with these two numbers, 247 and 100. So we start by saying we want the GCD of 247 and 100. So this is my A and B. And what I'm going to do repeatedly is just uh, until B becomes zero, I move B over to the left. So that takes the first argument and the second argument is going to be A mod B. So 247 mod 100, that's 47. And so now that's what I go with the next time around. So 47 is not zero. So now that becomes A. And then I take 100 mod 47. So 47 times two is like 94. So I guess that gives me six. And then I do this again. Um, so six is not zero. So now six is gonna go here and I'm gonna say 47 mod six. Uh, six times seven is 42. So I guess this mod equals five. And now we can kind of see that it's gonna end quickly from here. So five moves over, six mod five is one. Once you get down to one, that's the GCD, but technically according to this algorithm, we should go one more step to say one moves here and then five mod one is zero. So then one is what gets returned all the way back up. And one is indeed the GCD. So it seems like this is a slower method to use the Euclid's algorithm because we have to go these multiple steps, but I wanna emphasize that each of these steps is something that we can do even if the numbers are huge. All we have to do is just take mod and check if a number is equal to zero or not. As opposed to the, the method of factorization where the factorization as we saw with large numbers is there's really no good way to do it that anyone knows. In fact, the strength of RSA is gonna depend crucially on the fact that we can compute GCDs quickly, but we cannot factor the same size numbers quickly. Um, so even if your number has thousands of digits, you can run Euclidean algorithm to, 
to compute the GCD, but you don't have any way of factoring them. Um, so let's think about the analysis here. Uh, we're, this is an algorithms class. We want to worry about analysis. And, and there's an interesting um, case of algorithms analysis for this problem. And so what is going on with it is we, we can see that the really the cost depends on um, the size of the second argument. So there's kind of two arguments. And the running time, if we want to write it as both of these, we could say the running time is like one step when b equals 0. And otherwise, we have to do like one division plus um, t of b, uh, t of a mod b when b is greater than or equal to zero. But now we've definitely never seen anything like this, t of a mod b. What can we do about that? Well, we want to think about what's the largest that a mod b could be. <laughs> um, Okay, so, so we're kind of ignoring the first argument and just focusing on the size of the second one. And what's the largest that something mod something else could be? Well, we know that a mod b, a mod b is always less than or equal to b minus 1. Because that's what it works to say the remainder when you divide by b. It's, it's going to be at most b minus 1. That's good. So now we can rewrite this. Um, this running time as t of b, so b is the second argument, is 1 when b equals 0, or 1 plus t of, and I guess I'll make this a less than or equal to now, t of b minus 1 when b is greater than or equal to 0. right? Because that's the largest that that mod could be. So what this is saying is that in every step of the Euclidean algorithm, the second number is at least becoming 1 less than the first number. That makes sense. Uh, and now we have seen a recurrence like this before. So this tells us that t of b, because when I use a less than or equal to, I get a big O. Um, this is big O of a, uh, b time. So now that seems good. That's linear time. That means that the running time is big O of the second number that we give to GCD. Sounds great. But wait, I tricked you. Uh, as we learned last week, there's a difference between the size and the value of a number. So this is the b is the value, not the size. The size is like log of b, right? So this is the actual numerical value. If we have a 100-bit number b, then, then this is 2 to the 100. That's bad. Um, this, what this says is that for large numbers, even though it'll only take a few bytes potentially to store that number, this algorithm will essentially never terminate. Hmm. So, But I told you that Euclidean algorithm was good. This is an interesting case where actually our analysis was too loose. It seemed like a good idea of saying this, well, we know that the mod is at most b minus 1. And in fact, the mod a mod b can be as large as b minus 1. But yet, doing this analysis is uh, not giving us the true behavior. If you look back at this example, we started with 247 and 100 in the B position. If you look at the values of B, yes, OK, this from 6 to 5, it just goes down by 1. But most of the other time, it's going down by big jumps. It's not going like 100, 99, 98, 97. That would be slow. That would match the analysis that we just did. But it seems like it's actually going much faster than that. And if you, this isn't just a fluke for 247 and 100. If you try this for any like two three digit numbers, it's never going to take more than five or six steps. Um, so what's going on there? Why are we seeing something which is, seems to run quickly, but yet our, our analysis isn't matching it up? And the problem is that this less than, b, less than or equal to b minus 1, it's true, but it's not giving the whole picture. So sometimes what's really helpful is to help us to try to think of what is the worst case. And that can reveal where our analysis is a little bit weak. So like, when would a mod b um, equal b minus 1? Let's try to work out the worst case over here. When would a mod b equal b minus 1 is if uh, like a is 1 more than b, or if, they're, or if they're the same, or something like that. Um, yeah, so what if we had like, 100 as the second argument, and the first argument is 199. 
Okay, so then when I when I do this, I'm going to say 100 is not zero, so 100 moves over here. That becomes the next a, and a mod b is 99. So that's b minus one, like we said. So is this giving us the worst case? Well, now look what happens next. Now we have b minus one and b. So what is the next step going to be? Well, 99 is going to move over here, but now 100 mod 99 is just one. And then the next step is you know one and zero. So that's it. So what happens is that when, when this remainder is really large, it actually makes the rest of the algorithm go faster. Because if the remainder is large, then the next remainder is going to be small. So the trick with Euclidean algorithm um, is to look down two steps. So to get a better analysis, we look down two steps of the algorithm. And so let's think about that. There's actually two cases to consider. Um, so case one is maybe the more obvious case is that the first remainder is small. Remainder is small. So then that what that means is that A mod B if this is already less than b over 2, then we're good. We've already reduced that by half. But the interesting one is the other case that I kind of just hinted at. If the remainder is large, what does that mean? That means that a mod b is bigger than b divided by 2. Well, what's the second remainder going to be? So we're going to start with a and b, then we'll go to b and a mod b. But what is, uh, so I'll just give this a name. I'll say, call this c. That's the first remainder. So now the question is, um, at the next level down, I'm going to say b mod c. And how large is that? Well, that has to be less than or equal to, if you think about it, that always has to be less than or equal to the difference um, of b minus c. But now, because c is large, just like we saw with the 199 and 100, where it becomes 199, when that remainder is large, it means that this difference is small. So because um, c is greater than b over 2, that means that b minus c is uh, now has to be less than b over 2. Because c is large, so that difference um, can't be very large. And so what we get is that either way, if the first remainder is small, then that's great. We go down to b over 2 right away. But if the first remainder is large, then you just have to wait one more step, and you go down to b over 2. So overall, the recurrence we can get is actually something like, sorry, I'll say t of b, is 1 in the base case. But otherwise, there's at most like two steps before we get down to something which is b over 2. And now this recurrence is exactly like the thing for binary search. So this becomes big O of, um, I should say less than or equal to here. This becomes big O of log of B, which means it's linear time in the size. Remember, this, the size of that number is log B. That's how many bits it takes, um, whereas the value was B. So this turns out, in this case, to be the tighter analysis. And this is why the Euclidean algorithm is fast. So in summary, going back up to this, the number of steps that we have to take for the, uh, the Euclidean algorithm is at most log of b. Uh, and, and in fact, we, that will turn out to be a big theta of log b, but we have to um, think about why that's true by thinking about whether we were too loose in even this analysis. But this analysis of big O log b is is kind of good enough for us to get started. And I'll maybe talk about, um, or we'll do a, an example um, puzzle problem to try to think about what that worst case would be. OK, now, why do we care about the Euclidean algorithm so much? Well, we saw a couple applications of GCD. But one of the big ones is to actually compute this inverse, A inverse mod M. 
that's something that we need to do for uh, the RSA algorithm. And it's something we've kind of hinted at. So far, the only way of computing multiplicative inverses is to like look across that table to compute all the multiplication values until you see a one and then you say, okay, that tells me what the inverse is. But that, that method is really slow. It costs like big O of M time. So it's um, exponential in the size of M. And so it turns out that we can actually get this information from the Euclidean algorithm itself. So here's the full algorithm that's called the extended GCD or XGCD. And it returns not only the, the GCD G, but also these two multipliers S and T um, that are multiplied by each of the input numbers to give you that GCD. And one of these is going to turn out to be the, um, the multiplicative inverse. So this is what you'll see here and in the notes. But, but actually, I, I found that this S and T is just a little bit too much. We could spend like a couple days and, and really get comfortable with this XGCD algorithm. And maybe some of you feel like you're comfortable with it already. But I came up with a simplified version that just computes the modular inverse. So I'm going to show this to you now. And I'm also going to email this out. So here it is. Um, so what you should see on the screen now is we have, here's the normal GCD algorithm. Um, that's exactly the code that we just saw. But here's the GCD inverse. And what, you'll no what you should notice is that, um, so first of all, I'm writing it like M and A, so it's because it's really computing the inverse of A modulo M. So it has the same base case, and the arguments here are recursing in the same way. So we start with M and A, and then we go to A and M mod A. So the number of steps and everything for this algorithm is going to be the same. And the difference is this second value that gets returned. Um, and so that second value is just going to be the inverse of A modulo M. And uh, so this math, why does this actually work? G plus A minus Y times M divided by A. Um, I'll mention something like that in a second of why it actually works. But, but for right now, just suffice it to say that we do the same thing that we would do in the normal Euclidean algorithm. And then we just do this extra little computation with that second uh, recursive value. So it's doing one recursive call. But now each of these recursive calls returns two numbers instead of just one. It returns the GCD and this multiplicative inverse. And then we have to do a little bit of a correction with that multiplicative inverse, G plus A minus Y times M divided by A, to get back the, uh, the, original, um, the original multiplicative inverse that we want. OK, so this, this actually works. And like I said, I'll, I'll send this code to you. Um, Let's work it through on an example to actually see how that works. So I'm going to go over with the same example of 247 and 100, but uh, I'll do this on a separate sheet here just so we have a little bit more room to work with. So what we have to do when we're doing the XGCD, so the GCD inverse, I should say, of 247 and 100. What we have to do is um, we have to kind of think about going down in the recursive call and then coming back up. So uh, I might have to speed this up in the video, but I encourage you to work through that example from the um, starting with these two values and check with the work here to see if it actually works correctly. So here we go. Uh, so we start with 247 and 100. 100 is not 0. So um, 247 mod 100 is 47. So this is like the first recursive call. 47 is not 0. So 100 mod 47 is 6. Then 6 is not 0. And 47 mod 6 is 5. And then. Um, 6 mod 5 is 1. And we can actually end it there for this example. So now once we get down to this, we have to take the multiplicative, we have to compute the multiplicative inverses and, and work our way back up. So what we're asking here is what is um, the inverse of 1 mod 5? Well, in this base case, it's easy to see that it's just 1. The inverse of 1 is just 1. OK, great. So we can work our way back up now. And if you remember the formula, um, is g plus a minus y times m over a. So g plus a minus y 
times m divided by a, where y is the inverse of uh, inverse of the remainder modulo a. Okay, so what's going to get plugged in here? We're going to have one, that's the GCD, plus a, which is six, uh, sorry, a is five, minus um, the inverse from below, so five minus one, times m, which is six, divided by five. So this is one plus 24 divided by five, which turns out to be five. And we can check, five times five is 25, uh, mod six, that equals one. So this says that the inverse of five mod six is five. Great, so let's bring that up to the next step now. So now I'm on, I'll, I'll use a different color to signify that I'm on this next level. So we're gonna have, apply the same formula. So G plus A minus Y. So now A is six and Y is the value five from below. Six minus five times 47 divided by uh, six. So six minus five is one. So this is gonna be 48 divided by six. 48 divided by six, you should know is eight. So we can actually check six times eight is 48. 48 mod 47 is one, so that seems good. So now we work our way up. I'll go to a different color. Now at this level we have GCD is still one plus now it's going to be 47 minus the 8 from below times 100, all divided by 47. Okay, so 47 times 8, 47 minus 8, excuse me, is 39. So this should be 3901 over 47. And I'm not sure what that is, but let me calculate it. Thirty-nine oh one divided by forty-seven. It divides exactly, and the result is eighty-three. So this is eighty-three. So that tells us that the inverse of forty-seven mod one hundred should be eighty-three, and we can check that as well. So forty-seven times eighty-three mod one hundred should give us one. Great. And now we're almost home. We just have to do this one more level. One plus, now it's gonna be um, 100 minus 83 times 247 divided by 100. And if you calculate this out, uh, I won't bother to do the math, but it turns out to be 42, which is the answer to everything. So um, now we can check that 100 times 42 is this number, 4200, 4200 mod 247 is one. So the inverse of 100 mod 247 is equal to 42. And these are the steps that you do to compute it. So you can see that it's, it's the same kind of overall amount of work as uh, same asymptotic amount of work as a regular Euclidean algorithm, but it's just a little bit extra computation to compute these inverses. And that inverse, so this inverse of 42, um, that's how we can essentially divide by 100 mod 247. So instead of writing out every possible multiple of 100 mod 247, we just have to do this um, kind of formula and as we come back, as we recurse back up from the Euclidean algorithm. And then we get that as well in a log n number of steps. Okay, so that's all about the Euclidean algorithm. It's this old famous algorithm um, from 300 BC. When we extend it with a little more information, we can get modular inverses, and that turns out to be super important for the RSA computation. Thanks for paying attention, and I look forward to your questions and uh, seeing you on Friday.